So Rachel has kind of uh, set the context and from the discussion you you start to understand even more about the complexity of this whole food system and how it's interlinked with a range of other environmental and social issues. Um, and as this whole week is part of the Big Green Week, where um, communities all over the UK are demonstrating what they're doing in their places to, to tackle the challenge of climate change, um, I, I'm going to talk a bit about how we're approaching this here in North Lancashire around food. Um, so, hmm, is it going to change? Yes, it is. So I'll just say a little bit about um, who Food Futures is, um, and then I'll talk about our approach to dealing with this quite overwhelming um, big task ahead of us. So Food Futures is North Lancashire's Sustainable Food Place um, initiative. And as such, we're a member of the national network of places that are taking a similar approach to us. Um, and we came out of our transition towns movement here in Lancaster. So in 2014, um, a small group of volunteers, community food activists, um, growers were dreaming of what they wanted to create here in Lancaster around food and the need to upscale all the amazing work that was already going on came up time and time again. And so um, they chose to initiate a sustainable food cities, that's how it was known at the time, initiative here in Lancaster with the aim of joining up all of the stuff that was going on um, locally within the community food movement, um, whilst linking that into um, the work of other institutions and um, organisations locally, I guess. So as a partnership, what we're seeking to do is bring people together across our food system, whether you're an eater, whether that's a child, a pensioner, family, um, through to farmers, um, whether you're a community grower, you're running a dairy farm, um, you're conservation grazing or whatever, we're seeking to bring people across the food system together to think about food together and how we want to tackle the many challenges that our food system faces here in uh, Lancaster. And at the moment, we refer to the area we cover as North Lancashire which is essentially the Lancaster district political boundary. Um, and through this work, we've come to recognise that our common vision for the future lies around this idea of a thriving local food system that is healthy, resilient and fair. Now, that vision is in itself quite vague and it's purposely like that because we recognise that um, a sustainable diet and um, food system looks very different depending on your context and place. And if we were to ask everyone here tonight, what, what does it mean to you to have a healthy, resilient and fair food system? I imagine you'll all come out with some similar ideas, but also ideas that are a little different. Um, and in approaching our work around food, we are very much seeking to bring in that diversity of opinion um, in order to try and understand each other better across the food system, to build up relationships um, and essentially empathy about different approaches and perspectives, because um, we understand that there isn't one model for how you do this. Um, and our strengths really, if we're talking about how we as individuals can have an impact, um, it really comes from the fact that we're both bringing individuals together locally to talk about this together and also put in place things practically on the ground. But we're also feeding back all our learning. Um, um, we're sharing models that we trial out that work. Um, we're sharing what doesn't work with this whole other network of other places around the country to help in skilling up and taking forward this sort of work in every city, town, district, and now there are some places taking a county approach um, to make sure that we're, we are, we're doing this in a very grounded, wise, hopefully wise way. And through that network, we then have seats at 
at different tables. So we, we as a network have come together to lobby um, to feed into um, processes like the national food strategy. Um, there's a day of action next week where there's um, a lot of pressure being put on local authorities to sign up to the food and climate declaration in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow. So in taking all of these little actions locally, feeding them into local partnerships, to then feed into this national network that is lobbying for policy change and campaigning and putting pressure on national institutions, we all in our little actions can really have um, wider impacts and shift things across the country. Um, and luckily, like, our network isn't unusual in the UK. There are these sorts of networks that have established themselves all over the world. So there are transition town networks that now span the world. There are incredible edible networks that now span the world. The Food Sovereignty Network, La Vie Campesina, has been incredible at mobilizing peasant farmers and getting them at a seat at the table. Um, so this like model of organizing really can shift wider systems and put pressure and like Rod mentioned, hold um, bodies to account, like the UN, like our local council, uh, like the British government. So through all of this work, we're taking a systems approach. So we're trying to constantly think about the complexity of the food system um, when we're shaping up projects in order to try and avoid the, the challenges or problems caused when projects focus on a single issue. Um, and doing all this, we take a transitional design approach to our work, which is where the idea of active hope comes in. So I'm going to just talk about this approach a little bit now. So what do we mean by transitional design? Well, if we talked about all the challenges we're facing now, um, I don't know about you, but for me, I can get a huge sense of overwhelm. Um, and that can um, result in different things. For some people, it leads to apathy. For other people, it gets them really fired up and makes them determined to crack on and have a go at addressing those issues. Um, for other people, it can lead to a sense of almost powerlessness, like we can't make a difference. Um, and there's lots of like various psychological studies on um, how, how focusing on the problem can be really problematic from a behaviour change point of view. And so we've adopted a transitional design approach to try and shift that. Um, and to try and generate motivation to support people in having the energy to try and tackle the complexity. So when we talk about transitional design, we start from the point of dreaming and visioning. So for any of you that came to our strategy process, one of the questions we asked is, what do you dream for the future around food? What is your 2030 vision? What are your positive food futures? And when you start to ask that question, you take people to a completely different place. Um, and the ideas and dreams that were shared through our, our strategy process over the last year are just so exciting and inspiring. And I'll read some of them out in a moment to just give you a flavor of that. And once you've got that, like, dreamy quality, that, that really positive future looking vision, that's when we start to question, okay, so that's what we want to create. Um, and this is where we are now. What do we need to get there? And we backcast to look at the key um, actions that we're going to need to do here in North Lancashire in order to start to achieve some of the positive food visions that people have shared. And underlying that whole, once we backcast, we essentially um, have turned that into a strategy of sorts. And underlying that is a belief that essentially to achieve, um, to achieve that positive vision and all the work we're gonna have to do, it's really going to rely on healthy relationships. Um, and so everything that we are built around is around facilitating, bringing together and supporting collaborative working cultures. 
Um, and so we do that through how we run our meetings. Um, we've got people who are, are supporting us now to think about how we run community conversations in every area of Lancaster district that we can around this topic. Um, and we've looked through some of the skills that are needed for collaborative working and have run uh, Skillshare sessions around that. And we will continue to do so. But that those healthy relationships are the, we believe, the cornerstone of what's going to be needed if we are going to address the climate emergency and do it in a way where everyone in our district is well fed and, and nourished. So once we've backcast, another key element of this transitional design is to, as we've mentioned, take that systems approach to looking at the solutions. So once we've got the vision, once we've identified what we need to do to get there, and as we build these collaborative cultures, projects or ideas emerge. Um, and then to, to avoid that, that risk of ending up focusing just on single issues, we're trying to adopt design approaches to how we design projects to make sure that we are thinking about the different systems they intersect with. And just as an example, um, we are, we've just started a schools project that's looking at how we embed outdoor education, permaculture and aspects of rewilding into school curriculums. Um, and in doing that, we're training up the school coordinator on permaculture design. Um, we are introducing the schools to that, those design elements and the, the, the design principles. Um, and we very much take um, the SADIMET approach, I guess, to how we design our projects, evaluate them. So we don't just parachute into communities and enforce an idea. We spend time getting surveying the area or whether that's the school grounds or getting to know staff to understand what's already gone on, to understand what grows well, where and um, what resources a school has. We then analyse that to understand um, what we're working with and then we start thinking about a design and we refer back to some of the permaculture design principles or other regenerative design frameworks. We then implement the project um, as you would with a project um, and we monitor it to make sure that we're spotting things that aren't working and things that are working really well in order to tweak it and then constantly evaluate it and tweak it and evaluate it and tweak it. And we try and take that iterative dynamic approach to everything we do really, whether that's how we run meetings and check in on how they're going for people through to how we run projects um, and things like the magazine or the school's project to make sure that it really is meeting needs and is thinking about the different systems it's part of. And then once you have all these <laughs> designs in place and projects going, there's lots of opportunities and with time we hope they'll increase for people just to get active, join in and pick up parts that they want to play within all of that. And then we review and adapt this whole thing. Um, and I mentioned the strategy process um, and essentially over the last few years we've been talking to a lot of people and um, pulling together all the different dreams that different people have for this area. And in total, we had over 250 or people and linked organizations feed into that process. Um, and they came out oh, through that. We had so many amazing um, visions for different areas of our district, um, all linked to food. And you can see these all on our website. Um, and in doing that, um, we, we took the Lancaster District People's Dream and Climate Change Recommendations, um, all of their recommendations linked to food and farming fed into that process. We ran themed strategy days and focus groups with local farmer networks and procurement offices. We hosted community conversations in collaboration with different partners and ran a painted picture of our future activity in schools through our school partners. And then we had surveys, two feedback cycles, and there's a literature review that underlies this whole thing to make sure we're constantly reflecting back um, at the challenges and issues. And so all of this is now fed into um, 
So we've done all that positive visioning, we've done the backcasting, and we've identified what we feel are key areas that we're going to have to work around locally if we are to achieve the positive visions laid out in this community food strategy. Um, and I'm just going to talk through this a little more. Um, so from all the individual contributions to the visions, um, there were five like areas that themes or visions grouped around and these are really what has fed into and shaped our strategy the community food strategy process so there's um, a vision of a regenerative food economy and procurement um, and there's lots of details about what we see that as meaning and covering there's a vision for the right to nutritious and sustainable food for all so that's pulling together the voices of the Lancaster District Food Poverty Alliance, groups working around food poverty um, and emergency food support, and also surplus food distribution. There's a, a vision around cultivating healthy food and environment, so ecosystems, and as part of that, recognising that people are part of our ecosystem. And within that vision, agroecology very much sits at the heart of how food is produced for us in our region, um, ensuring that we are producing food in ways that is actively restorative of the ecosystems they rely on. There's a big vision around community food skills and building um, or a community wealth building process. Um, so horticulture and ecology, um, we want that to sit at the centre of educational settings um, and to be integrated as part of the Morecambe Bay curriculum. And there are various ideas about how we do that and how we create pathways for people to learn vital food skills from early learning years through to adult education. And then this whole working in partnership and collaboration um, is a really key vision that has come out of all of the little individual visions that people have shared. And underlying the visions again, and a lot of how we approach the process are some very core values. Um, and so there are some values that shape how we work and how we will continue to work and how we will look at facilitating the stuff in that strategy. And they center around cooperation, connections and action. So we actively are constantly questioning how we can be more inclusive, how we can support greater diversity in who's involved in our work, but also the types of projects that we support. Um, and as we are place-based, we're based in North Lancashire, um, we have this strong belief that um, the elements that make up a healthy, sustainable diet will not look the same for all place, people in all places. And so that really calls for us to take a decentralised approach to how we work and to bring in lots of different voices. Then there are some key values that came out of all the visioning work that essentially are key to um, how we might approach shifting our food system. So um, one of the key values is that healthy food would need to be embedded in our landscape in every possible way if this strategy is to succeed. Um, and one way of like explaining that is, is to imagine like a, a 20 minute neighborhood. So no matter where you live or work, within a 20 minute walk from your house, you will come across a community garden, a shop that sells locally grown produce, that's ideally organic. Um, there'll be biodiversity corridors near to where you live and green space where you can go and just be. And there'll also be easy access to emergency food support. And that food that is supplied through those sort of services is nutritious, healthy, and locally grown, ideally, or sustainable. Um, in order to tackle the challenges around our food system, there's a strong uh, belief that holistic approaches are needed for that, um, and that food production needs to therefore be founded on agroecological principles. Um, and I'm going to ignore those last two because they're a little bit, they're more complicated to explain, and I'm aware that I'm going way over time. 
So within our strategy, um, some key priorities came out through thinking through that backcasting work. Um, we feel that um, if we had to achieve the positive food visions within the strategy, um, we need to look at doing these seven things. So we need to build a movement around good food locally, healthy, sustainable food locally. And that will require a supporting collaborative working skills, setting up networking forums, building the Food Futures Partnership, also other partnerships locally that are working around food um, and facilitating that in a joined up way. Um, number two, there's a huge capacity building element. So we need as many people as possible to both get involved with this, which requires huge upskilling. So we need to support with that community skills element around food. But we also need um, much, much, much more money to be invested into supporting projects that are going to help realize the vision. Um, and so we'll be looking at how we can generate money and get money invested into agroecological farms locally in community food initiatives, in supporting the, the long-term running costs of projects. This is all going to be essential if we are going to achieve the visions in that strategy. Uh, the third strategic priority links to unlocking spaces. So this calls for us to find land and to free up land that can be used for all of the great ideas that are laid out in the strategy, but also um, abandoned buildings and other, other spaces that maybe aren't as well used as they could be. Like as you walk down the high streets in our towns, a lot of those buildings are empty now. How can we free those up for community initiatives and enterprises, kitchens, uh, barefoot colleges, cooking schools, all of these amazing um, things that have come out of the visioning. So we'll be looking to how we do that and working with other partners nationally and locally to look at how we might approach that. Then there's this whole idea about personal development pathways. Um, and this really links to how can we work with people where they're at and support them to get to where they want to be. Um, so whether that's someone who has heard about the issue of climate change and wants to learn how they can take action and can feel like they can take action. So how do we support that process? Through to how do we find the kids in schools that are interested in growing and actually encourage that rather than discourage that um, and support children in developing vital food skills that's gonna be needed for all the amazing ideas that have come out in our strategy. And then there's this whole um, area of celebrating stories of transition. And this really recognises that there's so much already going on already in our district and that maybe the stories of the people already involved in taking climate action, in building more sustainable food systems, perhaps they're not as widely known as they should be and perhaps they don't get as much attention as they should. Um, so we are going to be working on how we can really celebrate people that are already taking steps to address the climate emergency around food and how can we uplift their voices and make sure that we're telling those stories from as many different perspectives as possible so that people can relate to those stories and feel like maybe they could have a role within this bigger transition piece of work. Then we have a whole um, area of redistribution, reimagining, repurposing. And this recognises that actually we produce um, so much food locally that there's a lot that goes to waste. And how can we actually make sure that that's getting to the people that need it, whilst also thinking about how we stop producing that waste in the first place. Um, so this whole area involves setting up cleaning networks, ensuring that we're composting properly and then redistributing that compost to groups locally that need it. Um, how can we actually make use of current waste streams and build businesses around it? So there are other areas of the country that are growing mushrooms on spent coffee grounds or 
they uh, there are groups now looking at how you compost clothing or build um, what other ideas uh, sharing libraries to reduce consumption. So this whole area requires us to completely reimagine how we want our food economy to work here and how we can get waste streams, nutrients, resources flowing locally rather than just being sent to landfill or wasted in other ways. And then there's this whole campaigning element where we hold local authorities to account. So Lancaster City Council has declared a climate emergency and now we need to hold them accountable to that and ensure that they, they follow that through when it comes to food stuff. Um, same for national governments and other local stakeholders that maybe have put in place policies that sound great, but maybe they're not um, implementing them as well as we would hope they would. So there's this whole area in campaigning. And within this, we're aware that one of the big threats to lots of the visions within our strategy linked to planning. And so we're seeking to feed into how the local planners reviews into planning policies and documents and to feed into consultation around that. Um, and within our whole approach, we do believe that everyone has a role to play. And to try and facilitate that, um, we have created all these working groups that you can see in this image that are themed around different topics that some people have a lot of passion around. Um, and we find that through these, we tend to come across people who are so passionate and also so skilled in different ways and have a really um there's so much potential that they can play in taking the strategy forward but maybe there's an element needed to support them in finding their place um, and so at the moment we're working to build induction pathways and look at how we support people in coming into the network and finding their place and then finding their role within this wider vision and strategy and like I said, we, um, we're trying to tell those aspirational stories and um, through citizen journalism is an idea that we're playing around with. We've just launched the Thrive magazine um, as a way to tell stories written by local uh, residents about the work that they're doing. And we continue to like think about how we might do that better. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip this slide actually, because I think it will come out in the questions and I spent too long talking. Um, and so I've talked a lot about the theory of what we're doing um, and I've probably missed out quite a bit and probably not said it in the clearest way. So feedback is welcome. But through doing our whole strategy process and, and through our working groups, we try to build on momentum and energy to make sure that projects are actually happening on the ground that are aligned to the vision and that we learn from them, share the learnings and then adapt them and roll them out. And over the last year, I, these are just some of the projects that have come about through the strategy process, through people getting excited, so basically. So we've got these so-and-so libraries that have popped up around the city that um, are distributing and sharing locally grown seeds with local growers, but also sewing supplies um, for fixing and repairing. And there are now, I think there are five boxes that have been put up around the city to trial. And we've had lots more people come forward to want to try, um, try them out and create their own. Um, the seed library has, has increased the amount of seeds that it's sowing and following the seed exchange that we ran in January this year, there were so many more people that came forward to swap seeds um, and that led to some seed saving training, skill shares. And now we have a new project that started off in Caton now that is swapping seeds. And there's another one in Hesham um, where an allotment site is looking at how they can support more seed saving. The plot, so Lancaster's farm start scheme has, has uh, gone through its first growing season. Um, they've set up now uh, an open food network shop and they're starting to look at how they build a local food distribution infrastructure to support other local growers and sharing their produce directly with local retailers and eaters. Um, and the plot has had its first um, cohort of farm starters go through 
and one of them is now looking to set up a market garden and they're also starting to look at other sites that they can move to such as the land on the brewery behind the brewery. Um, we set up this food friend scheme as another way to start um, trying to raise funds to support new entrants into farming essentially. So if you haven't um, had a look at the food friend scheme you can um, and essentially it's a small society lottery scheme so people become a member they put five pounds a month into the scheme then each month there's a prize draw to win local food vouchers with partners that are the food businesses essentially that are aligned with our values and all the money raised goes into supporting the rollout of the farm start scheme and costs linked to setting up new market gardens and sites um, so there's a direct way that you could get involved in trying to build um, this vision of agroecological growers all around our city where the wildings are is a school project so this has now started and Robin I'm aware you worked on the ground to so say that's building on all the learnings from that project and it's looking at how schools invest into the training and actually embed the work into the curriculum and we're starting with a small pilot of schools um, that are made up a mixture of inner city schools that are fully tarmacked through to rural schools with large grounds and other schools that are on the edge of um, urban spaces with grounds and they're going to test out this model and way of working with this sit, this pilot of seven schools and then from that they're going to roll that out so that's already starting that that vision and work around creating pathways around sustainable food skills and then with the pandemic, we saw a huge rise in emergency food support needs locally. Um, and we luckily, through all the work that had been going on, had the key infrastructure in place to meet that demand. So Egg Cup massively upscaled its work. Um, and it's now, Egg Cup is now building relationships with other food businesses locally to identify where there is food waste that it hasn't yet tapped into. Um, and then we trialed out a gleaning network during the pandemic to look at how we might move surplus produce from farms into egg cups distribution network. Um, and yeah, in general, it just kind of emphasized the strength of having in place all this local community food infrastructure essentially, and how that builds resilience. Um, and we are going to this strategy that I keep referring to um, it's not uh, completed and finished it's, it's got a 10-year vision but we very much expect to constantly be reviewing and adapting it over the next 10 years um, we recognize that it might not have captured all voices and so we're constantly welcoming new people to feed in ideas um, to tell us what we've missed um, to share other ideas and we'll be holding um, an event in at the end of November to review progress over the last years and how we're working um, and how we can improve on what we've done. Um, within how we run our working groups, we always end in, in uh, an evaluation or closing round to understand how people felt the meetings have run um, and how we can improve them. We've built in feedback cycles into all our projects. Um, and so expect to see changes and um, if you want to get involved we very much welcome your your feedback on what we've done so far 